Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back from what I hope was a nice lunch break and plenty of chance to talk among yourselves and to continue to discuss the really important and I think interesting matters that have been cropping up over the last day and a half. I'm very proud indeed to be able to be in the position to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Bob Meldrum, who's the Principal Director of Music Army. In fact, the Army's senior musician and a fine musician in his own right. And he will really, in his own words, not only uh, introduce himself and the remarkable work that he's done throughout his military career <coughs> as a musician, um, but it leaves me only to say, Bob, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you. Uh, it's a great um, privilege to be here to talk, talking to uh, such a, a, a mix of professional people with such a strong interest in um, that wonderful thing, music. Um, I got the graveyard shift, really, didn't I? Two o'clock on the second day, and following, following the young Guy Booth, who I sent along to entertain you and uh, impress you with his uh, stories, um, but it's my own fault. Um, okay, I've got 35 minutes, so let's crack on. Uh, a little bit about me, then, so you know wh wh who's talking to you. I, I, I enlisted as a junior musician uh, back in April 75. Um, I was an oboist through to about December 85, amongst many other things. Uh, that was my, my principal musical role. Uh, I was a bandmaster, so you're going to see um, uh, Ben Mason, I think, conducting the Royal Artillery Band later on today. Uh, bandmaster for a number of years, as you can see. A director of music, so a commissioned officer since March 1994. And the principal director of music for the British Army since March 2009, so some four and a half years. I retire on the 27th of September <laughs> and today is my last day in uniform <laughs> which means I'm open to job offers so if you're looking for a musical brain <clears throat> uh, who's a really good strategist and uh, a man who can lead and make things happen then you're looking at one here we go <clears throat> But you would think, principal director of music, you would think I would do a lot of this. I'm, I'm sorry if that's uh, rather dark. That's me conducting an orchestral concert uh, two years ago. Uh, this is last December. I was d uh, the director of music for the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo. Played to a quarter of a million people in, in about three weeks. So that's what you'd think my title says I do. But actually, that's what I do a great deal of. And that photograph was taken two mornings ago. So I'm really a strategist. I'm a planner. Um, I'm custodian of, of the standards um, uh, that, we, that we put out. Uh, I, I think about the future. I've had a lot to do with the, the reorganization of Army Music um, as we move forward into the new era of Army 2020 and how we're going to be configured. I'm very much uh, an advocate of specialize, not compromise, uh, and that's been my sort of banner through the last four and a half years. Um, I'm going to talk to you about music and operations, um, and I'm really looking at three phases, and it's a pictorial story um, spanning the, the years that I've served pretty much, uh, 38 and a half. All right, so we're going to look at what I, I've, this is my terminology, the build-up to battle, so this is what happens in theatre and, and where music sits. Um, Post-conflict, so once the conflict, the fighting is over, uh, or we're in a stabilisation period on the ground, uh, waiting to extract, um, which can be many, many years, as we've seen. And then, of course, um, there is the post-deployment um, effect that music has for um, supporting our soldiers back, back here in the UK. So I'm going to look at a number of cases. The, the first Gulf War, Op Granby. At that point, I was a, a young, fresh-faced looking bandmaster, as you might see in a moment or two. That was 1991, 1990-91. Uh, uh, leaping forward uh, almost a decade to the millennium period, uh, the Balkans, when I was in Kosovo with, as a young director of music. I keep saying the word young, just remember that. Um, <clears throat> and then my most recent outing uh, was in 2006 with the band that you're seeing uh, this evening, the Royal Artillery Band. Um, and, but I'd just like to emphasize, this is my personal views and observations based on my personal experiences. This is how I um, uh, record uh, the effect that music has had 
uh, throughout those three phases which we're going to look at. So phase one, the build up to, to battle, the in theatre preparation for that which is going to happen uh, when we engage with the enemy, if you like. So we're looking at Op, Op Granby. Um, who's the audience then? Well, obviously in an operational theatre, you're on the ground. Uh, Op Granby uh, was in Saudi Arabia, uh, moving north um, to, to Q8. So basically, we were on a massive piece of sandpaper in the middle of nowhere. No relief, nothing. So the audience was very much the service personnel uh, preparing to, to, to go into battle. And the music at the time, as far as I'm concerned, it filled a very, mu very much filled a social and uh, sensory void. You know, we, we gave the soldiers something because they had nothing else um, to, to, to stimulate them. So there's no pubs, there's no drinking, there's no girlfriends, wives, children, uh, television, nothing. So we, we were pretty much it and we helped alleviate boredom. And, and what we had to offer was much more of a focus um, uh, looking at these lines. You know, when, when combat is imminent, when the threat is growing, and that the uncertainty of what is to come when you're putting on your, your, um, your chemical suits, um, bearing in mind that we were under threat of chemical attack at that time. So as all of that is happening, then what we had to offer as musicians uh, playing for our soldiers was very, very important. And I make a, a correlation here with religion. Very much like religion, music became more important as that uncertainty and, I guess, threat to my, my life, if you like, uh, being a soldier, uh, came about. And as I said earlier, a picture paints a thousand words, so I thought I would do this pictorially. So we're going, I'm going to take you through a series of photographs. This is Fallingbostel in Germany. The man on the left is my Bansart Major. He's a very fine cornet player, and uh, you you'll all know, I'm sure, that our, our role has been for many, many years, um, or was for many, many years, to support the medical services. So we inoculated all of the soldiers before we deployed. No problem there. They could go home to their wives and girlfriends, and life continues at normal. This is now on an aircraft. We've landed in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we're on the port uh, in Al Jabail. The humidity is unbelievable. You're practically breathing water. Um, it's very, very unbearable. There's a lot of sickness in diarrhea. And then there's a lot of that early uncertainty until familiarization has happened. Now, I was, amongst, I was on the, one of the first flights out there, and I, I slept in this uh, wareside, uh, warehouse hangar on the dockside. And it was just sleeping bag, sleeping bag, sleeping bag. Lots and lots of soldiers. The Padre did his thing. He thought, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll have a church service. I pulled a chromatic harmonica out of my, my backpack and I played the hymns to 600 soldiers on a harmonica. Now, isn't that interesting? Do you think they would have come to listen to me play the harmonica if they could have popped down the road to the pub back here? I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> so I was very quickly elevated to a position of stardom. <clears throat> Um, and, and as you can see, once we, once we were established and moved into the desert, well, the humidity was a lot better, and our musicians practiced um, because that's what musicians do. And even then, you can see the gentleman on the, r the, gentleman on the right conducting there has got a big smile on his face, hasn't he? Uh, he, was the, uh, he was one of our senior warrant officers in the battalion, the Staffords, and um, he came out and conducted the band one day. He had nothing else to do. He was smiley happy. It was, again, a little bit of something is better than absolutely nothing. Moving forward to the 21st of December in 1990, for us, our day, the battle honour, the main battle honour of the 1st Battalion, the Staffordshire Regiment, of which I was bound at the time. And as you can see, we are now very much out on that massive sheet of sandpaper. In the background, you can see uh, the flag uh, blowing. There's actually a sandstorm going on there, but do those soldiers care? No, they don't. So we're playing music for them. The guy who's facing the band is actually an American soldier, so this has got a reach beyond our own people. He was an American soldier attached to our, our, our battle group, and he's conducting the band there. And this is without beer, ladies and gentlemen. This is soldiers banging uh, percussion instruments together without beer in the middle of the day, having a great time, because there's nothing else for them. That same Sergeant Major, who was uh, doing the inoculations, um, had a serious role to play as well. Um, sadly, his son was killed in Afghanistan last year, which was uh, a very sad loss to him and his family and to, to, to us that knew him. Um, but back then, he, he, he would play the bugle, um, the bugle calls at our various services. 
That is the front cover of the Stafford Knot, the regimental journal. And you can see there the warrior in the background, the fighting vehicle. You can see the band playing the hymns for the church service. It is commemorating the, the battle honor, remembering uh, our previous fallen and so forth. And you can see the, the Union flag and, of course, our regimental flag. The band are always there, front and center, supporting, because without the band, it would be nothing. Soldiers don't sing well unless they've got something to follow. <laughs>